Continuing on with my obsession with tiny computers, here is my Samsung Q1 Ultra Mobile Portable Computer, or UMPC. This was released in the UK in the first week of June 2006. The front of the device is dominated by a 7-inch WVGA resistive touchscreen and using the Easy Display Manager software allowed on-the-fly screen resolution changes. On the left is a multi-directional navigation key and below is a button to change the screen resolution. On the right are four user programmable buttons. Below that is an enter key button and another button to bring up Samsung's on-screen menu for quickly accessing system settings. Below the display are notification LEDs as well as two microphones. On the left hand side of the device is a full size USB port, headphone jack, a volume slider as well as a hold button which I have no idea what the purpose is for. On the right hand side of the device we have another full size USB port as well as a full size VGA port and power in. On the top is the power switch and a compact flashcard slot and somewhere to store the stylus. For a device of its size there is an extremely good selection of ports. You could of course use the UMPC as a standalone device and use the on-screen keyboard for entering text but you wouldn't want to do this for extended periods of time so in the box comes a USB keyboard. The keyboard isn't great however, there is a lot of flex but the keys have nice travel and positive feedback when pressed so you are never unsure if you've pressed a button or not. The cable isn't long enough to plug into the left hand port, so it's generally plugged into the one on the right. Of course the only downside to using the keyboard is that you'll lose one of your USB ports whilst it's in use. There are a number of function keys that can be activated with the FN key as well as a nipple style mouse above the B key and between the G and H keys. On the very front of the keyboard are the mouse buttons. These work satisfactorily, but does mean sometimes spurious mouse buttons are clicked whilst typing. When turned on, several of the LEDs are lit up. The hard disk activity light is on the left. Charging status indicator is next, as well as LEDs telling you if the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth radios are on. These LEDs in a dark room are incredibly bright and can cause some annoyance. So we've booted up and logged in. Let's take a look at the specs. Here we can see that we are running Windows XP Tablet PC Edition. Windows XP came in several flavors, including Home, Professional, Tablet PC Edition as well as Media Center Edition. The processor is an ultra low voltage CPU running at 900 MHz. The Q1 shipped with 512MB of RAM but could be upgraded to 3GB. The only reason why I haven't done this yet is because you have to disassemble the whole device as there's no easy access door to the RAM slot. No disassemble! Opening my computer and clicking on the hard drive, we can see that it's the standard 40 gigabyte drive. Even after installing Windows XP, Microsoft Office and several other pieces of software, there is still over three quarters of the drive available. Now if we have a look at the display properties, this is where things start to go downhill. The display has a native resolution of only 800 by 480 pixels, and some things don't fit the display correctly, such as the system properties. The OK and Cancel buttons get obscured by the taskbar. To get round this you could set the taskbar to auto hide but this might not suit everyone. Pressing the button on the left hand side of the display quickly brings up a resolution switcher. This allows you to quickly set a higher screen resolution than what the native display can provide. The high resolutions are resized to fit which does at times help get you out of a fix but leads to very blurry icons and text, something I wouldn't recommend running in for too long. Now if you do choose to run the display at its native resolution you're going to get nagged at a lot about things not fitting in well, as well as having horizontal and vertical scrolling bars in nearly all applications. If we open up Microsoft Word and open a very important document, you can see that at 90% the document fits the display horizontally, but the number of vertical lines of text isn't many. Because of the screen resolution, editing large documents is awkward as you're limited to what can be displayed at any one time. Increasing the zoom to 100% introduces a horizontal scrolling bar, and nobody likes scrolling horizontally. Next, if we fire up Internet Explorer 8, you can see how much of the display is filled up by the title bar, address bar, menu bar, favorite bar, and finally the tab bar. Yes, most of these can be turned off, but by default, unless you like to fiddle, the actual portion of the display to render a website is very small. Finally, if you open an image editing application, such as Google's Picasa, you can see just how cramped the display can get. Light image editing can be achieved. 
but as you can't see the image any larger than what I'd call a thumbnail, you can't be certain of what the edits you had carried out looked like. The colour reproduction of the display is good, but it's not the brightest display out there. It's let down by its resolution, and that's why I ended up not buying one. I tried a Windows XP virtual machine at 800 by 480 to see if I could get on with it and found it a frustrating venture. However, this device came up on eBay for a great price, so I thought I'd buy it and see what I'd missed out when it was introduced. And what device demo would be complete without trying out Solitaire? Having had a colour handheld PC with Solitaire included in ROM, playing with a mouse on a PC always seemed awkward. Here we can put the stylus and touchscreen to good use. So what was special about Windows XP Tablet Edition? Were there any extras? Yes, aside from the on-screen keyboard and handwriting recognition, there were two applications. The first is a sticky notes application, which is kind of like the notes part of Outlook if you use it, but this is more focused on stylus input. The main part of the window is a canvas and can be used to handwrite notes or draw, as well as a record button to record audio. It's a bit basic, but could come in handy. There is an item in the Tablet PC Start menu folder called Tablet PC Tutorials, which opens your browser and takes you to a website which is now defunct, so we'll skip over that and move on to the next application, called Windows Journal. When the application is launched, it looks like a notebook. It allowed the user to create and organise handwritten notes and drawings and save them in the .jnt file format, or export them to the TIFF image format. Windows Journal was not visibly updated after its introduction and eventually became obsolete, although it was tested for compatibility throughout the development of new versions of Windows and patched for security vulnerabilities as recently as May 2016. Windows Journal was available in the original July 2015 release of Windows 10 and the November update, but it was removed in the summer 2016 anniversary update. All of its features are available in OneNote, which is integrated into Windows 10, but OneNote does not support the JNT file format. Aside from these two applications, the rest of Windows XP Tablet Edition is identical to Windows XP Professional, allowing it to be domain joined as well as being controlled remotely by RDP. So how small is the Q1 UMPC? Well, here's my 12-inch iBook G3. If we put the Q1 down in front of the display, you can really see how tiny it is. And if I place my HP 620 LX in front of that, the UMPC is almost completely obscured. I would have never believed back in the Windows C handheld PC days that eventually you could have a full x86 PC running desktop windows in such a small form factor. If we place the handheld PC to one side and the UMPC to the other, you can see how thin the device is. Granted, it's not as thin as an iPad or another tablet today, but 15 years ago this tech was impressive. So what was it like as a media player? I mean, something this size is perfect for taking with you, and it's small enough to fit on an airplane table. Well, audio through the speakers was poor, and one thing I haven't mentioned is the drone of the fan. For such a small device, it's bloody loud. Now admittedly, you're not going to be using the front-facing speakers for watching a full movie, or listening to your favourite MP3s, but they do get loud, which is a bonus as it drowns out the noise of the fan. I suspect that most people use the headphone socket on the left. Playback of MP4 videos and VLC media player is more than adequate, but another issue with the display to moan about is how reflective it is. The resistive touch layer, although matte, does give off a significant amount of glare and reflection. And the display isn't the brightest, as I've mentioned already. They can't stop me. No problem. Perhaps in a darkened room this might not pose much of a problem. The battery life was quoted at 3 hours, which I've not been able to test, but there was also an optional high capacity battery, which would increase the life to 6 hours but would add significant bulk. The final question is, will it doom? Well of course it will, it's a PC after all, and doom runs on anything, possibly even my electric toothbrush. Now I've never been very good at doom, but here's some quick gameplay.
It's at this point in the game I got stuck, not because I suck, but because of the stupid display. It just wasn't bright enough for me to see where to go. So in summary, what are my thoughts on the Q1 UMPC? Well, despite the poor brightness and the screen resolution, I actually don't think it was a bad device. The ports are plentiful, it's not too heavy, I just wish something could be done about the fan noise. I'm glad I didn't have one back in the day as they sold for $799 US. In the next video, we'll have a look at my trusty iBook G3. Thanks for watching, see you in the next one.